Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you so far for this morning, how we've, uh, uh, I could see that many of us this morning were challenged, were brought into a closer relationship with you. And now, Lord, as we look at your word for this final time in 1 Corinthians, Lord, we ask that you'll speak into us in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, this is it. We finish 1 Corinthians today. Oh, you've been enjoying it. It's okay. We'll, we'll carry on biblical teaching. Don't worry. It's just that the letter's finally going to finish. I, we've been going on it all, all, nearly all year now. I actually started it back at the beginning of this year and uh, slowly but surely been wake, working our way through. So at the very end, I'm hoping that we're just going to quickly run through what we've learned over the whole letter. And don't panic. I'm not going to expect you to remember everything, so I will run through the bullet points. But what now? We last week. Who was here last week? Marvellous. Here's that real question. What did you learn last week? We see bones, but God see an army. Amen. We see bones. Do you know something? I look back at the recording because I thought, what did I do? What did I say? I have no idea, because as you know, it wasn't part of anything. And I looked back and I went, no wonder I spent half the time stopping myself. So, for those who weren't here, we basically were looking at 1 Corinthians 15, but went to Ezekiel 37 briefly to prove something that Paul was looking at about the resurrection of the dead. But basically at that point, God then went to me, you're now going to carry on with Ezekiel 37 for a while. There's a message I need to portray. Yes? The message was, for those who are here, we see bones... God. Okay, have you picked that up? Good. So anything else we learned? Or was that it? We did really go on about it. I've actually put in the blurb for the website, this really isn't about 1 Corinthians 15, I apologise. <laughs> okay, because... Not, some of you weren't here last week, some were, that's the bit to remember. Part of the other thing was that our input from God... The fact that the gifts that we've got, the blessings that we have, is actually for the benefit of outputting to others. It's not all about me taking it on and being selfish. We also looked at 116 uh, verses 1 to 4. We should be giving financially as led by God. That's the bit we probably didn't want to remember and probably ignore. Rather see the we see bones, God sees an army, but... And everything we do for God in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58 is never futile. Whatever work you do for God, there will be fruit from it. It is never futile. Do not be disheartened. There's always something. So now for the last time in 1 Corinthians. It's almost like saying goodbye to an old friend at the moment for me this is. Having spent so long reading up. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, 16, sorry, verses 5 to 9. And hopefully this is working. I am coming to visit you after I've been to Macedonia, for I am planning to travel through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay a while with you, possibly all winter, and then you may send me on my way to my next destination. This time I don't want to make just a short visit and then go right on. I want to come and stay a while if the Lord will let me. In the meantime, I will be staying here at Ephesus until the festival of Pentecost. There is a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me. It's interesting, isn't it, the Denzel's stuff today about opening the wide doors? Believe you me, she didn't go and look at this and see when I was... Preaching. Interesting. We'll come back to that later. Anyway, what we've got here is uh, the Apostle Paul very greatly and very kindly giving us his travel plans. 
Isn't that nice? He wants to tell the church at Corinth, because currently he is staying in Ephesus, he wants to tell them his travel plans. And really, he's also sort of trying to point out to them that I'm going to come and stay with you for a long period of time over winter. That's my plans. Now, clearly he's saying he wants to travel through Macedonia into Corinth. And normally when we do our travel plans, you can go to your local um, sort of travel agent, can't you? So I fancy doing this, but stopping off here halfway through, what does that look like? Or you go on the internet these days and apparently do all that sort of way of doing it. Or you go to companies of various names that might have travel in them or have something to do with cooking. Don't you get that? Oh, I thought I got that. You doubting lot. You're doubting Thomases and no cooking. Come on. Oh, fine. Anyway, here we got Paul giving. Now, do, would you know that this could just seem such a nice short trip, you know, nip down to Heathrow, throw up the old passport, jump on the plane, fly, land into Macedonia, do in Macedonia, come back out of Macedonia and land in Corinth. That's what it would sound like, wouldn't it? Well, just to give you an idea why it wouldn't be like that, when they say, oh, I just fancy popping on down, it's not some nice trip excursion that Paul is designing for himself. It would normally mean travelling by boat along the coast of Asia to Troas, then travelling by sea over to Neapolis to, in Macedonia at the northern end of the Aegean Sea, and then following the Via Asia west at least until Thessalonica. And there he could have travelled either by the eastern coast of Macedonia by land or by sea in Acacia and then to Athens and then on to Corinth, which would have taken a few months. It would not have been a nice, short, easy journey. So when we read this in the Bible, understand that it's a serious trek and it takes lots of planning, lots of considering the seasons, especially when he's going to lay over with them over winter time. It's because actually you wouldn't be able to travel after that. All the boats would sort of shore themselves up and not want to travel the sea. So it's not, how can I put it? Yeah, it's not an easy journey. So he's telling them his travel plans. I think he's doing it partially to say, well, I'm hoping to spread the gospel in Macedonia, but I want to come and stay with you. And as we know in this letter, part of the reason is that he's been sort of, you know, he has been telling them off, hasn't he? He's been doing a lot of correcting in this letter. But fortunately, we know from two Corinthians, which really is four Corinthians. Do you remember that? Okay, but that's irrelevant. Paul actually ended up making an unscheduled visit, brief stop to Corinth, prior to going to Macedonia. So his travel plans he's written here actually didn't go according to his plan. Unfortunately, that visit, that, that short stop off, um, added extra relational complications between the church and Paul. And we're going to look a bit later on to why he might have made those plans change. But we know that Paul felt he wanted to do this travel plan. But as Proverbs 19.21 says, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Maybe God had other plans. We can lay out all the plans that we should, can't we? We can plan our whole life, our whole destiny and future, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know, thinking maybe about pensions or retirement or career or whatever. There's nothing wrong with all of that. But we always have to sort of say, but Lord, what is it you want me to do? Be open to it. Suddenly God going, actually, I had something else in mind. Yeah? And all plans are by God's grace anyway. Because in verse 7, he makes it very clear. He says, if the Lord will let me. These are my plans as long as the Lord will let me. I used to remember years ago that uh, Timmy used to turn around to me when I say to him, see you Tuesday or see you Sunday, you know, for leadership team meetings or whatever. And he'd always go, by God's grace. And he still does it today, by God's grace. And I used to sit there going, no, it's going to happen. No, it is by God's grace. But what we have here is Paul clearly saying he wants to make an extended missionary journey, preaching the gospel. 
And for him to want to stay over at winter time, I don't think was just um, a whim of a moment. I don't think for Paul, this was the idea of saying, I want to stay for you over winter, like it was just, well, because I'm going to end my journey with you just in time. I think there was a plan there to actually spend some quality time with the church, to maybe reinforce on a personal level, one-to-one, the stuff that he's been correcting them, them about in the letter. I think he wanted to give some teaching, encourage them. I believe there was a lot more that Paul was doing there in his original plan. And of course, once he's stuck there for winter, he's stuck. They didn't have snow plows then. Not that I think it snowed either, but you know what I mean. And then, if you note, there's something he wants to do. In the meantime, I'll be staying here at Ephesus until the festival of Pentecost. So he's telling what he's hanging around. The festival of Pentecost um, uh, it was one of the Jewish festivals. Interesting that he should mention that, but um, it's not irrelevant for this morning's uh, uh, sermon. So I'm not going to talk about that too much. But in verse 6, that's where it is. I knew it was somewhere. When he wants to stay with them at winter time, he's then said to them, can you send me on my way to my next destination? He clearly expects the church, once he's finished there, to send him, actually dispatch him out with their blessing in peace. And also, this means, providing for his needs for his onward journey, both money, food, clothes. Which is interesting, he's actually telling them, this is what I want you to do. Yet we know in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul states at the time that when he was planting the church in Corinth, he refused material help from them, didn't he? He said he wanted to live so that the gospel was free, so that he could preach without them saying, oh, well, we're paying this man to preach this gospel. Because in Corinth, it was the time that you got paid. If you was a good, eloquent speaker, if you came out with fantastic rhetoric and a great way of convincing people, maybe that the sky was purple rather than blue, people actually paid you to do that. So I think some of the message lost its gravitas, lost some of its thing, because you're being paid to preach this. Who's seen that car advert with the guys driving some car? He said, I'm being paid to tell you this advert, but I got a truth thing attached to my neck and eventually makes something, and this car makes me a wonderful lover or something, and then it zips him. Do you know the car advert I'm talking about? Yeah? It's the same sort of thing. It's that sense of, well, you know it's an advert. You know these actors are being paid to tell you this. Well, here for Paul, when he was planting the church, he didn't want them to pay him. He wanted to live off of his own means so that there was no way they could say, well, he's getting paid to tell us this. Do you see what I mean? Makes much more of a, um, a, a gravitas within that, that region. But here now he's saying, well, you're an established church. I've done all of that. It is now your role when I land, when I'm back and finishing and moving on to preach the gospel elsewhere. I want to be able to do that for free elsewhere, but I can only do that because you're now going to support me. Do you get the point? I think that's what makes that. And we do that here today. As you know, when we send out our missionaries, we send them. And, you know, collectively here as a body, as a church, as individuals and people in the wider area help actually support that work that they are doing. Verse 9. There is a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me. He's talking about being in Ephesus. And I want to just expand on this just a little bit. Well, hang on a minute, Paul. There's a wide open door for you to preach the gospel. God's flung wide the heavenly gates. Let the king of glory come on in. Well, many are opposing me. Ever felt, ever felt that time when you've gone, heard God clearly and say, right, I want you to move into this area, I don't know, change your job or here I want you to go and talk to somebody about the gospel, yeah? Yeah? And all of a sudden, you're coming up against opposition. Then you start questioning yourself. Did I hear God right? What went wrong? Did I make a mistake? Ever been there? 
Anyone raise their hands? There should be a whole raft of us should have our hands up. Do you know why? Because just because God opens a door doesn't mean opposition is not there. Note the fact that it was God that opened the door. He said, there is a wide open door for a great work here. He's not talking about I opened the door. God opened the door. And that's part of the thing that we must remember. It's so easy to want to go and... and, and, and sh- Where's Carol? She's gone. Her testimony was brilliant this morning, wasn't it? She went on that holiday not pushing the agenda. She let God push the agenda. She let God open the door. Do you see the? It's the same thing for us. We must learn to do that. It's so easy. I remember in my early days of becoming a Christian, I was so enthusiastic. I would tell everybody at work that Jesus loves you. Did you know that? Jesus loves you. Do you know that? Gosh, he so wants you. I lost a lot of friends very, 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 very quickly. We have to let God open the door. There is always this tension that actually where God is making a headway, opposition will come. Note that phrase, will come. It's not if, maybe, not sure. Will come. Excuse me. So I don't aim to misbehave this morning. I don't think so yet. For those who don't get that reference, uh, last week I ended up chucking a chunk of the sermon away because God had something else to say. He opened a door that I didn't expect. And I aim to misbehave. There's a thing, uh, a, a great term, Latin term that's used, missio dei, which means the mission of God or sending God. And it's uh, within theological terms, it means basically you go working where God is already active, where God has opened the door. That's where you go and operate. You don't operate um, um, deciding to do it yourself, like my terrible example of what I did when I first became a Christian. Jesus made it very clear. He said, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son does also in John 5, 19. Now, if our Lord Jesus Christ had to turn around and say, I'm only going to go and do what I see my father up to, Father God, then how should we be any different? We have to learn to see what God is up to and thinking where God is working, where he's spreading his gospel, not go jumping in with our two flat feet and hoping for the best. Our role as Christians is to discover where he is active. Amen? I bet there are plenty of your people that are within your network, you would love them to hear the gospel when you see them. And if you're honest, as we come back to, and I said it last week, and funnily enough, it got emphasized again this morning in testimony time, friends and family are the hardest ones to preach to. And preach, I mean in the right terms, you know, give testimony of God's love and care. And I'm sure every time somebody, there's somebody you see virtually every day, you see once a week and you think, today is the day I want to tell them about Jesus. And you might try and force it in a little bit, you know. Somebody might turn around and say, oh, did you watch, you know, that TV program last night on... Oh, let's try and think of something. Um, oh, really? Did you see that TV program EastEnders? I don't ever watch it. But do you ever see that TV program, EastEnders, and somebody talks about, I don't know, some violence that happens, etc. cetera, and you send he's going to go, yes, well, you know Jesus, you try and force it in, yeah? You ever done that? Trying to work it round somehow, the conversation, and you don't really ask them, and you want to try and somehow start the conversation going, and you wonder why they shut down on you. It's because they're not ready yet. God's not quite opened the door. And that's the same what goes for us as a church out there proclaiming the gospel. We need to know where God is already working so we can join him in it. We need to be able to do that together, yes? But how do you hear God 
How do you hear him when he's saying, and go here? Or now say this. How do you do that? How do you hear God? He'll speak to you. Listen. You have to listen. Listen. Say that again. Listen. Say it again louder. Listen. What do we do? We listen. I always love it when we always say, oh, I pray to God all the time. And I go, amen. Do you listen as well? We need to listen together as a church, don't we? If we want to know what God wants us to do. You know, I said like next week, it's going to be the new vision statement, strategic objectives that's going to be launched at the members meeting for those that are members. And then after the members meeting, I'll be talking more and more about it during Sunday uh, mornings. Well, part of that process is we want to know where God wants us to work and we will need to listen together as a church corporately. So actually, very soon, you're going to hear where you get the opportunity to do that. Where we come together to listen to God. Notice I've not said it's corporate prayer. It's not a church prayer evening. It's a listening gathering where we come and listen to God together. We've had it now, uh, uh, prophecies over many, many years. One of the things up here, it's, um, if I can, uh, if I can, Quickly grab it, it's down about here. Nope. Oh yeah, more waiting on me. How can you hear me if you don't listen together? If you've never read this, I would suggest you come over here and read it. Because we need to know where God is at work. We need to be where he is. And we need to listen together. But there is nothing wrong in the fact that when you get opposition, and we will get lots, because that's what happens when you're working where God is working. So if Paul suffered from it, many opposed me. It didn't mean he didn't keep going, did it? He kept going. I find that quite encouraging. And funnily enough, Jesus also stated this. A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally, they will persecute you. And I said, in this country, we don't get persecuted. We get a bit of trouble, but we don't get persecuted. You might get somebody smile at you and call you an idiot. We don't get persecuted. It's our brothers and sisters in other countries that get truly persecuted. And plus also, we must never assume that an attack comes from the outside. Do you remember my rheumatoid arthritis analogy? We have to be on the lookout for each other, discern the spirits. Sometimes the attack can come from the inside of the body. We have to be discerning. We want to do great things, do we not? Amen? Do you know, I know you're tired, and I know this is probably not the best sermon in the world that you're hearing today, and I'm not got you standing up and shouting at each other, you see bones, I see an army, and God's, we see bones and God sees an army. I appreciate all of that, but... Do you want to work outside? Do you want to see the gospel out there? Do you want to see people coming to know Jesus? Do you actually want to see this community changed? Do you want to see that the ground is going to get taken again for the love of Jesus? Okay. So we have to be prepared for the fact that opposition will come. And part of that is that we need to be discerning of the spirits. But we also need to be enthusiastic about the idea. The giftings we got, the blessings you have now, are not for you. You get that when we die and we get the resurrection body. The blessings and the giftings you have now are for those out there so they get to be in here or whatever church they want to go to. It's not about Greenford Baptist Church, it's about the kingdom of God. Yeah? So we're enthusiastic a little bit. Thank you, Anne. Anybody else? Can we have an amen? amen? Thank you. So we have to be cautious about a lot of things. And I said it before, the RA analogy is 
that sometimes Satan can trick somebody within the body to actually believe that they are doing God's work by attacking maybe the leadership of this church, but actually it's the person that's been conned. Now at that point, you're starting to think, is Pastor Warren trying to tell us something secret about a member of this church? No. Just talking about, it's like any good army, if you want to stop an army progressing, what do you do? You take out the people that see the vision or see what maybe is happening. You take out some of the leaders, don't you? That's what they do. So I'm just bearing that in mind. We see bones, God sees army. Take out some of the leadership. And that's what happens. And here we see Paul seeing this as well. Just so you know, the computer wishes to tell me that uh, a new update is available on Norton Antivirus right now. Um, just thought you'd like to know that. Uh, shall I update now or wait till later? We think we'll remind me later. <laughs> Love this computer. Which is now broken. I don't believe. Yes, it's gone. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read from the Bible now. As I was saying, only this week at the Ministry Network meeting, papyrus, the best technology in the world that God ever invented. Do you know why? It's always there. It doesn't crash. It doesn't break. It doesn't burn. You don't have to back it up. It's here on paper. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the meeting. Why is that? Well, my phone crashed on me. Use a diary. Never does that to you. Sorry, that wasn't at the Ministry Network meeting that somebody said that. It's, just, it's a memory I have from a few years ago. Uh, verses 10 uh, to 11. When Timothy comes, don't intimidate him. He's doing the Lord's work just as I am. Don't let anyone treat him with contempt. Send him on his way with your blessing when he returns to me. I expect him to come with the other believers. Paul is again still reflecting on the fact that the Corinthian church or some members within the Corinthian church are opposing the leadership. And Paul has been spending this whole letter correcting and rebuking in part of that. We know by now that there are some very clearly strong, aggressive, ungodly characters within the Corinthian church. Yes? And we know that in 1 Corinthians 4, Paul mentions that he's sending Timothy to them anyway. And that Paul, Timothy is going to come and instruct them in just like it was Paul doing the instructions. Now, we also know there's something that church that clearly have got on animosity towards Paul. So if you're sending along your representative, i.e. Timothy, Paul's clear concern is that they're going to take out their anger about Paul on Timothy. Yeah? It's sort of almost no different from us. We're there to represent Jesus Christ. If you're not happy with this idea of Jesus Christ, maybe people in the past have been hurt by the church. Church global, international, worldwide, or they're perceived hurt by the church, they're going to take it out on anybody that represents Jesus, aren't they? It's the same sort of thing. And he's obviously very concerned. So he needs to make a note here that actually um, don't intimidate him. He's doing the Lord's work just as I am. He's doing exactly what I'm doing. He's equal to me. Don't let anybody treat him with contempt while he is there. Don't let them abuse him. Stand with him if someone within the congregation starts on him. It's that. Back him up. Don't be silent. Let him know that you are with him. Let the ungodly person in your membership know they cannot continue in this manner anymore. Back your leader up, says Paul. Or back up Timothy. Do you get the point? I know that's not all there, but that's what is there. Stand by them. Don't be silent. Don't just sort of quietly go, oh, yeah, pull them. Back them up publicly. Let it be known that the big mouth that's speaking at this church, Paul is saying, doesn't get away with it. A 
again, I'm not secretly trying to tell you something underlying there. I'm just picking up uh, some of Paul's passion here. Then he's saying, then send him on his way. And again, it's that same thing. Send him on his way, as Paul was saying, send me on my way, in shalom, in peace, provided for, for his traveling pants. He's returning back to me. We're not quite sure who the other believers are, and it's not particularly relevant here. But here's a thought for you. Timothy's gone to Corinth, gone to the church, gone seen how bad it really is, returned back to Paul to say to Paul, it's not good out there. It's rough. I wonder if that's why Paul changed his plans and went straight to Corinth rather than his original plan in the letter. Ever thought that? Suddenly thought, actually, I better just get there. It looks like it's going to completely collapse and cave in with all these different factions. Let me get in there. Something I thought of and thought, yeah, it's probably a good idea, but he made it worse. Read 2 Corinthians. It makes it very, very clear that Paul's visit basically made it worse (laughs) because people thought he was being undermining and being, you know, double dealing as such. And he wasn't. So have a read. Verse 12. Now, about our brother Apollos, I urged him to visit you with other believers, but he's not willing to go right now. He will see you later when he has the opportunity. Do you remember right at the beginning, Paul talks about, oh, some say I follow Cephas, some say I follow Apollos, some say I follow, do you remember that? And there's these little factions now, where people follow their, their preferred leader within the church. Well, having this right at the end, I would say, could look just like a nice little aside that Paul's doing, but actually he's not. He's saying... Apollos, I've urged my brother, our brother Apollos, closely aligning the relationship, saying we're together in this. We're actually teaching the same things. And he's saying, you know, I wanted Apollos to come to you, but Apollos hasn't. It's almost like a nonchalant here that Apollos is saying, well, I can't be bothered right now. Maybe Apollos is actually very unhappy. There's this Apollos cult following within the Corinthian church. So by being a little bit like, say to Paul, oh, I'm not going to go, I can't be worried, I'm not, I'll come when I feel like it. He's sort of telling the Apollos lot in Corinth, you know, I'm not really that bothered. So they start thinking, oh, do you see what I mean? It starts wavering there, they're following of him. He's giving that sort of, well, I'm not that really bothered to sort of come rushing over to see you. That might help them change their allegiance to Apollos and maybe shake them up a bit. I think Paul is trying to say, you know, we apostles are the same. We are aligned. We teachers, church leaders are aligned together in what we are teaching. And then we finish soon here with what is now seen from these next set of verses from 13 onwards, the sign-off, the big letter sign off which is done in the typical style of its time we normally write at the end of letters if you have any queries please do not hesitate hesitate what's a hesitate if you ever see one of those letters from me that says please do not hesitate just know i was having a bad moment if you have any queries please please do not hesitate to contact me do you see that at the end of the day see an all insurance letter this is that sort of sign off but much nicer we think So 13 to 14, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. It's almost like a summary of uh, all the teaching that he's been doing. First and foremost, there's echoes here for me in those two verses of Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20, the armor of God. Be on your guard against attack, mainly from within and from without. Be ever watchful is in there, and that sense of being watchful for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be on your guard against the cultural norms from the outside, which the church, as we know, are taking in everything from sexual immorality uh, to some of the cultural, and they're taking it all in. He's almost summary saying, be on your guard, keep it out, don't let it take over. 
that it not infiltrate the church ranks. Stand firm in the faith. Hold on to what you know, is what he is saying here. And then this thing, be courageous. Now, I just need to unpack that a little bit, but first and foremost, I need to, um, excuse me. Do you know, I woke up Friday morning, my foot for some reason was hurting me. I went swimming, I felt fine swimming, and then about an hour I started sneezing, I had a major cold come on. I just, for those who don't know, I've just had a weeks and weeks of bad back, bad shoulder, cold, this, I've had enough. Seriously. <laughs> a great door is being wide open. So, and upon that whining like that, be courageous. Actually, the Greek here, ready for this? And I love this bit. The Greek here actually means be men. Now, for my sisters in the congregation, I understand that might be a bit of a difficulty. So it might be a little more like be like men. So if you can get a bit deeper with your voices. No, being a little bit. He's actually not just be courageous. And, and, the right translation sort of be courageous is correct because back then to be a man was the sense of provide and be a man. Defend, you know, your area, your city, get involved in all that. It's that sort of courageous, warlike, warrior type, army type sense that the man is to provide. The man is meant to be the strong one. I know now, now, equality type way of thinking. Goodness me, we're not allowed to say that. But yes, we are. The masculine spirit still exists. See the silence. We don't like that, do we? Spent years, quite rightly so, trying to level out the field between the two genders. I fully appreciate it, and it's still not there yet. Barry, I suggest you run before this service finishes. <laughs> There's a number of ladies in the house. That, anyway, appreciate, genuinely, that's correct. There should be fair treatment right across. But that doesn't mean that the feminine spirit gets reduced, and it doesn't mean the masculine spirit gets reduced. Do you understand the difference? And especially in church... Men need to be... <laughs> men need to be... Men? Just need to be men. There is a sense that we need to actually... T I know I'm a man saying this, so bear with me. But, you know, we need to be men. And according to one commentator I read, who I just didn't write it down here. Actually, these verses, a true man is vigilant against danger, faithful to the truth, brave in the face of opposition, persistent through trials, and above all, loving. Ephesians 5, when it talks about husband and wives, there's one line that says, wives, submit to your husbands. And men have abused that over the years. They forgot the other seven odd verses that talks about them loving their wives as Christ loved the church. What did he do? He died for the church. So men, the only reason women love and submit to their husbands is because their husbands, excuse me, I know we're going to go, but bear with me. Husbands, yeah, actually love their wives so much that they think about the wife first before themselves. That's the only reason. Yes, Barry, and that's right. Thank you very much. Has he redeemed himself? No, oh, okay. Anyway, moving on. So the same case comes here. Whether you're a husband and wife, either married or not, it's irrelevant. The same thing here works out in my mind. We submit to each other because of our love of Christ and our love for the other, wanting to see the best in the other. But it doesn't mean we put down our feminine spirit or our masculine spirit. The men can still be men. 
meant to be vigilant, meant to be looking out. The women do the same. But do you understand the point? Saying, be courageous. A man back then doesn't allow the world to infiltrate his home. He doesn't allow danger to come across his threshold, does he? That was the point. And today should be the same thing. But also here, the same thing is that a man most certainly doesn't bring in that danger himself. He doesn't allow himself to be corrupted and bring that into the home. It's the same thing here. So be loving. Primarily is what I would say first, then everything else. So be men, or here would be much better these days, be like men. So that means also, my sisters, you're the same. To be like men, be vigilant, be fearless in, in danger, against danger, persist in all trials. It's the same thing. Pearl was not being a sexist. That was right across the gender board. And that verse 14, very clear when it says, and do everything with love, is wrapping up chapter 13, isn't it? That great wedding Great wedding filler. I mean, that great wedding statement that helps back up the sermon that the pastor is about to preach. Verses 15 to 18. You know that Stephanus and his household were the first of the harvest of believers in Greece, and they're spending their lives in service to God's people. I urge you, dear brothers and sisters, to submit to them and others like them who serve with such devotion. I am glad that Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Archaicus, that will do. That sounds terrible, doesn't it? And I practice that. Have come here. They've been providing the help you weren't here to give me. They have been a wonderful encouragement to me as they have been to you. You must show your appreciation to all who serve so well. Part of this is Paul really sort of, obviously he's been provided for by Stephanus and his household. Those who are part of the Corinthian church, they have come and provided. And he's saying, Look, here you've got within your own ranks people who you should be looking to for an example of what it is to serve the Lord. Submit to such people as these. Do that. Show your appreciation for them. Encourage them. So easy to be serving quietly in the background doing God's work slowly but surely. And people know about it, but don't actually ever come up and say, do you know something? Thank you. You're a great example to me of what it is to be a Christian. If you know people like that, go up to them. I'm not talking about me at the front. Go up to the people that do the stuff behind the scenes. Encourage them. I just want to finish on these final bits. 19 to 20. The churches here in the province of Asia send greetings in the Lord, as do Aquila and Priscilla and all the others who gather in their home for church meetings. All the brothers and sisters here send greetings to you. Greet each other with Christian love. Paul is showing the Corinthian church that they're not an entity on their own. He repeatedly states throughout the whole letter, doesn't he? As I teach in all other churches. He's saying you are connected to other bodies around. You're not on your own. He also uses Aquila and Priscilla here because they're a couple that have been well known to the Corinthian church. They would part of the setting up. And that sort of warm note here that he's sending, that they send their greetings, means I am still friends with these people who you clearly love. We are together in this. It's back again, aligning, saying, we're not all separated out here. It's you that separated us, saying, I follow this one, I follow that one. We are all still together as one body in our worship time. And it's just connecting them, saying, you know, there's other churches, other churches that meet together, and you are connected to them. We are as well. Within the Baptist Union of Great Britain, we're known as the Baptist churches. It's because, actually, officially, we're all independent. 
But we align ourselves with the Baptist Union because it's theology and it's understanding. It's not like where other denominations have, um, you know, the Church of England literally means all the churches that come under the Church of England. We're Baptist churches together. We can officially be sort of independent, but we're not. We're interdependent. We're connected with our other Baptist family. We're also then also connected with all the other denominations, our Methodist brothers and sisters, our Church of England brothers and sisters, and all of that because of Jesus Christ. So don't ever sit there and think, oh, that's that denomination, because that's daft. We're like this now because of history, but we actually should be one unified body under Jesus Christ. And that's what we are. We're all connected. So if you feel like that, scrap that now. Why do you think we as a church work with the other churches in the area? It's because we believe we're all after the same thing, to see our Lord Jesus Christ proclaimed in this community. And I think Paul needed to really correct the Corinthians in their misunderstanding here. And then this great line, greet each other with Christian love, which really is with a sacred kiss. Greet each other with a sacred kiss. A holy kiss is really the term of phrase. And what it is, this is emphasizing something rather than that, just don't meet up and shake somebody's hand, which is what we all do, don't we? When we're greeting someone, you shake their hand, don't you, if you meet anybody? This is a much more emphasis on that. It is a much more of a actually have a real meaning in your greeting. We are unified. We belong to each other. Paul uses this term as written. He normally does it when churches are in conflict. Actually realize when you give each other a holy kiss, actually say, it's because I know that I am connected to you. You are my brother or sister in Christ. It's normally brother's a brother, but you are mine. I am with you. It's a much deeper meaning behind it. Rather than that wonderful when sometimes you meet somebody you haven't seen for ages and, you know, you're not closest of friends, or, but, you know, you know like each other and you go, mwah, mwah. <laughs> when did it become two? It used to be just one. It used to be just, oh, nice to see you. But now it's like, no, two. Oh, okay. And I had somebody recently, three. Why three? <laughs> no, I'm not four. What's going on with our culture? It's unbelievable. But it's not that, rather than, oh, oh, hi, nice to meet you. It's a real sense of, actually, you are my brother and sister in Christ. <clears throat> Wrap each other. No, I'm not instigating we men start kissing each other. <laughs> On the cheek. But they do that in other cultures, and there's nothing wrong with that. Just that culture, just not here. But I appreciate that you are my brother or sister in Christ. When you just give me a big hug, all right? That's what he's trying to get at. He's trying to get them to realize that they need to re reinforce the fact that they are together under Jesus because there is so much conflict in this church. 21 to 24. Here is my greeting in my own handwriting, says Paul. And if anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. Our Lord, come. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Here is a common practice for the author of a letter, because Paul would have had somebody writing why he dictated, to actually at the end sign off in his own handwriting. So it showed the fact that actually he sort of edited it, he's read it, he's agreed with this content, he's signing off. And no different from what used to happen before the love of email came along. You know, you'd get your PA person would write out the letter for the director, the letter would then come back into the director, and then the director would read it and then sign it in pen. Yeah, it's the same sort of thing in my, my way of looking at it. But now these days, it's the signature is just the bit at the bottom of your email. Just, anyway. It's that sort of final sign-off here that he is doing. And verse 22, if anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. Gosh, isn't those hard words? In our beautifully tolerant society today, Gosh, you can't say that. Oh, yes, we can. Don't want to, but we have to. If you're not in, you're out. It's quite clear in the Bible. If you're not in, you're out. 
Don't want it to be, but that's the way it is. That's why it's our job to go out there, to get them in where God is working. But also here, there's a potential that Paul is also having a go at the troublemaker, makers in the Corinthian church. And so it's actually a curse. Just bear that in mind a minute. Paul, big apostle Paul, Christian, lover of Jesus, the whole lot is cursing someone. Just run that for a minute. But we're meant to be loving. Yeah, but if somebody's really that against God at the moment and he's ungodly, they're out. And as one, uh, as a, uh, uh, It's not Schubert, but it's Schubert. I can't pronounce his name properly. In the Old Testament, such a curse formula was used when the intention was to discourage someone from transgressing, a far-reaching legal or ethical command. In this context, the curse formula is the most severe means of separating the community from the evildoer. Not the evildoer from the community. It's getting the community to realise This person is not for the Lord. They are cursed. Remove yourself from them. And it's so intolerable. Now, this does not mean because people are not Christians out there, we remove ourselves from them. The Corinthians were making that mistake all along. No, we are to go and reach people and bring them in. But if they're part of the body and they're actually doing going against God's work, there's a point that they do not love the Lord. There's a point that you say, that's it. Enough is enough. Out. Hard words. We don't like that because we've got to be all loving, haven't we? Loving doesn't mean warm and cuddly. Are you all warm and cuddly? Am I warm and cuddly? Ask my family. No. But sometimes you have to be like you have to be and say it like it is. Jesus, when he said, I have come here not to bring peace but to divide, he was not lying. The gospel message does divide. It does ultimately, at Judgment Day, make a separation between those who are in and those who are out. We don't like the idea anymore because oh, all roads lead to God. No, they don't. So sometimes we have to live in that truth. It's a cheerful sermon, this one, isn't it, at the end? Sort of the one you want to see. You rather please, if you have any queries, please do not hesitate to contact me. Our Lord, come. Maranatha is the, uh, uh, and I've never pronounced it ever, but there you go. Our Lord, come. Actually is, come Lord and redress, redress the wrong and establish right rule. That's what that means. And that should be every Christian's prayer. Amen? I'm going to be finishing in 30 seconds. Amen? Amen. So you're happy about that? So, the final sign-off. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus, which is him saying, actually, I love you. This whole letter is because I love you. You may not like it, but as like a good father who disciplines their child because they love them, it's the same thing. You discipline your child because you love them. That's meant to be why you discipline them. Not because they just annoyed you and you didn't get your own way. You do it because you love them. And every parent and every child that's grown up will know what struggle that is. Paul here is doing it as like a loving father. Our God disciplines us and we should rejoice because it means he loves us. Same thing. So, this whole letter, and that's what it was about. I knew I would need to rush through this without any real open questions uh, uh, today. But these are the things that I just wanted to pick out just for this last bit. That what have we learned throughout the whole of this letter? We're going to say goodbye to 1 Corinthians. But I do encourage you, reread it all the way through. And if you've missed anything, it is on uh, the website. And do you know what the blessing of that is? After 20 minutes, you can pause me, walk away, give yourself a break from me, and then go back again. It's great. 
But this for me is one of the key things. We are sanctified now. He said it right at the beginning in 1 Corinthians 1. We are sanctified now. If you're a lover of Jesus Christ and you've given your life over to him, you are holy today. Hello? You're meant to be happy about that. Part of the other thing, which is very difficult for me to say, seeing I am a church leader, but actually we are to accept the authority of the church leaders. They're here to build the church that God wants, not the church that the church wants. We must be on our guard, test the spirits at all times. Our spiritual gifts are for the other person, not for ourselves, not for our own selfish reasons. They're not there to reaffirm me and make me feel good. The giftings I've got, whatever they are, be they one or ten, is irrelevant. They are for somebody else. Either be it within the church body or those who don't know Jesus yet. It is for the other And this is the big thing, the bigger pitch he kept trying to give them. We have a hope in Christ of the resurrection of the dead, that we're all going to live forever. Oh, you're getting there slowly. But we have got a resurrection hope that is to keep our focus in times of trial and problems and issues that we know that we are going to have and live with our Jesus forever. And that should keep our focus. That should be our constant backdrop. And absolutely nothing whatsoever that had to do with 1 Corinthians, but clearly God wanted to say something to us going forward. You see bones, he sees a... See that one you're enthusiastic about. So I hope you've learned some of 1 Corinthians. I know I have as I've gone through, as I've admitted to you over times. And I've gone slightly over, I apologise for that. But um, yeah, let's just pray for a moment. Lord, we thank you for Paul. We thank you for the trials he went through in your name. Through his so love of the church, his love of you, and then the love of the church, that he was willing to correct, to rebuke, to take abuse himself so that your gospel could flourish, so that your people could flourish. Lord, I pray for all of us here that uh, maybe as we revisit 1 Corinthians, we'll hear you speaking to us. that we will be on our guard. We will know that we are holy people. And we live that out. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.